Harold Maycant here, um, Natural England, as you can see, I'm, I'm a senior land management advisor. I have had a number of roles and jobs within NE. I've also had a role as I was saying, an agronomist beforehand, before I joined up with Natural England. I did that for 15, 16 years. And I did actually have some customers in around this part of the world, such as, so to say, Philip Chamberlain over at Crowmarsh Battle. You know, he was one of the people I talked to with reference to precision farming and the like. And so, yes, it's interesting to come back. And then I have to fess up that for the last two years, I was also involved in the world of DEFRA policy. And I kind of got chosen to be a policy advisor by the Secretary of State, Mr Eustace. So that's good, you know, that's interesting. I did that as well as the day job, so you can imagine there was a lot of sort of um, long nights, but that was all right. And then with all the political shenanigans and changes, then that came to an end and that was the end of that, which isn't, you know, two years is, is quite long enough for these sort of things. And I think sometimes you get a bit stale in it or you realise how much you miss the day job, which is being a land management advisor, talking to farmers, advising you know, the interface between agriculture and the environment. And having done the job in sort of 40, getting on for 40 years now, what is also interesting is the way in which farming has changed in that time. It's been quite interesting to see how agriculture has really embraced and taken on a lot of environmental messages that are coming through. And it kind of reflects the way that society is also changing. So let's kick off. And I'll have to get this going. Hopefully the whole thing goes. There's some animations going on. So as you can see, we're talking about the future of future farming. A lot of people have this rather bucolic vision of farming. It was all merry peasants drinking cider. But for reality, for a lot of these people, you know, this was the reality. It was grim. You know, it wasn't that nice. And when people say we want to go back to how it used to be, I'm kind of thinking, how far back do you want to go? This painting was 1565. It was Peter Bruegel, the Flemish artist. So this was painted when Queen Elizabeth was on the throne. And you can see it's not a happy sight. It's not a happy, happy sort of um, scene. And that is actually a, re a reflection. We've got to get this mic sorted out because it will wander in or out of the world in which they lived in. And, you know, mortality. A lot of these people died pretty quickly. So here we are. This is life expectancy. 15 to 9, so we're about there. You can see that for a large proportion... I might need the roving mic. Yeah, right. Is it switch on the ball? Yeah, the yeah. Is that going? Good, good, good. I'm going to be, I'm going to be maxed out here. I can wander as I will now. Good. Okay. But you can kind of see, you know, how life expectancy for a lot of people in that early period was pretty grim. Hence the rather dismaying image that you see in front of you know, that Broyle painted. And then as we got a little bit better into the 18th century, life expectancy picked up. And that curve is being followed by every country in the world. So even though China in itself was way behind us, it's got better. And you can see that even a country such as Ethiopia, which doesn't have a best of reputations as being on, on the cusp of modernity, there it is, following the same thing. So this is sort of where human development, the demographics, this is where agriculture is taking us. So we have a bit of a challenge here. It's how we're going to feed all these people and how's it all going to work so that we can all fit everything in. And here you have it, global population. <laughs> It's quite scary when you look at it in some respects. And it's quite interesting, wasn't it? Last week, we hit the 8 billionth person. Now, I don't know who's counting, but I think it was on the 15th of November. Somebody said it was on the 14th. But you're getting, you can see that. Now, I was born just here about there. Three billion off was on the, on the planet then. And I thought, you can just see how that, that, there are pressures there, which we're now going to have to face. And how are we going to come do that? Which is why agriculture is going to be absolutely key in the development and survival of, 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 of fellow humans. Now, you want to know where are, where are all these people? Now, this one is a little bit misleading because of the map projection, because there you've got the UK. It looks quite big. But according to this, we've only got about 66 million of us. But other countries closer to the equator are, are, um, don't show as 
as large. But you can kind of see that a lot of the pressures on the global agricultural systems are going to be from the China, from India, the Philippines, Indonesia. It's going to be around this end of the world. And we're, we're sort of up there with a, an often a diminishing population. Countries in Eastern Europe, for instance, are dropping, pop, are dropping in population. And that's going to have an impact on the way that we get labour and we can fund sort of people working in fields. And if they're not working in here, then will they work in Germany? But I have heard that Germany, Spain are all got a labour crisis for farm work. So we're going to have to think about how we do that and maybe technology will come to our rescue or maybe not. So in my previous life as a sort of a policy advisor, you look at things and you think about things. And one of the things that you look about is trying to see where are the risks coming from? What's going to be coming down the line which is going to hit us? And what's going to make things difficult in society and all that stuff? And so this is along here, you think, oh, it's going to happen, and this is what's going to happen. So, okay, it's 2021, so things have sort of shifted a little bit because of the way in which the Ukraine has kicked off. And weapons of mass destruction, i.e. nuclear, have been talked about a little bit more. Whereas before, it was highly unlikely that it was going to happen. Well, the risk has sort of come on a link. But if you also look at this top end here, that's the bit which we're going to look at, because that's the bit which farming is at. That's where farming is, you know, it's in with the environment. It's the extreme weather impacts upon it. The environmental damage, biodiversity, infectious diseases. It's not just COVID, but at the moment, I don't know if anybody's tried to buy eggs recently from Lidl's, but how many packets could you buy? Bird flu, an infectious disease. The same will happen with swine flu. So infectious diseases can be problematical. And when they do happen, as we saw with COVID, very impressive. And then climate action failure, I think that's one of the things that I will bang on a little bit about, is that this is going to be the biggest driver of many of the changes that we're going to have as a society in the next years. Now, you know, it's probably going to be hitting my children before it hits me. So, anyway, so, always good to know where you stand, isn't it? And I know that this is always attributed to Donald Rumsfeld. There are the known knowns. And the unknown known, 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 knowns, and the unknown unknowns. So I like to think that we have a few of these things that we have on the radar. I like to think that there's some of these things that we can say we've got an idea. But I should also also think that here's another little graph. You'll be sick of graphs at the end of this, of this talk. There's a lot of them. Now this is the famous Dunning-Kruger thing. Anybody? It's, and we all do it. We all know a little bit, but we think we're clever. And so, you know, you, 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 you realise that after a little while, you're not so clever and you start, and your, your confidence in what you know drops down. And then when you become an expert, you're up here. So I'd like to think after today, after this evening, we'll have pushed everybody along this, this, along here. We'll all be a little bit wiser. Anybody wants to ask me a question, please feel free. You know, that's the whole point of this thing, is that we understand, we exchange information, we knowledge, we share, and that we learn something. So, right then, farming and the future of farming. Now, this is, this is for a lot of people what farming is about in the, in the UK. You know, we've got big machinery, huge amounts of investments, you know. You'd be spending for a combine like that probably the best part of 350, 400,000 pounds. Very expensive. And you look at the number of kits and the tractors and whatnots involved. Huge amount of metal, huge amount of horsepower. But it has had an amazing impact on how we have produced food and what we're doing. So we are producing lots of food. Great. So just to roll back the clock a little bit about farming, it's the thing we've been doing the longest in, 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 the, in the country, really. You know, we were hunter-gatherers for a little while, and then we started domesticating animals. What well, isn't quite, I've found, you know, when you, when you look around for information, is how soon or what, when we started to get friendly with dogs. Thousands of years before any of the other animals, so there was something going on there. So we got the domestication of animals, and you can see that over here we start taking on sheep and then eventually cattle and horses, and then we go on from there. So that's been, that's been an ongoing process. And then we're looking at the cultivation of plants as well. So once we started to work out how to look after some animals, we thought, right, we better start feeding ourselves. 
And so we've got this thing about you know, where we've been growing these crops. And you can see that we've got, you know, it was quite a long time ago, 8,000 BC, so that's 10,000 years ago, sort of starting to grow grasses, which were a little bit different. So they, they picked them out and they started to look after them and grow them on. And it wasn't just happening in, in sort of the, you know, the, the, the delta or the Euphrates Valley. It was going on in the Yangtze Basin. It was happening in Mexico. Wherever there were humans, they wanted to grow and make crops. And with that, you started the whole business of changing the way that the planet looked. We've got the alteration of habitats, starting to get divisions of labours. You know, here's obviously somebody who's a bit better than these ones, and these that put us souls having to do all the hard work. Uh, you know, wherever you stand on that. So society starts to form, and it's, it's you know, we've kicked off. The journey started. So here we are, 5,000 years ago. This is how the planet looked. Hardly much of a way of an impact from ourselves. We were doing a little bit of, of uh, cultivation, but the vast majority of it was, was still natural, natural habitats. Way over 50%, half the world plus was, was forest. You've got these grasslands. And then in this corner here, I put the, what the population is. So if you remember the graph we showed before where it went zoom straight up, well, there were about 19 million or so, you know, the, the, um, the boffins tell us. That's great, you know, we're not having much of an impact on the world. We're, we're living quite happily. There's, there's a nice opportunities for everybody. Okay, you get diseases and things like that and possibly eaten by the odd wolf. But generally, you'd be okay. And then we zoom forward in time. So we're trying to go into the beginning of the industrial age. You know, the population of the world has started to increase quite significantly. You know, you think the Roman empires, the Chinese empires, what's going on in India, there's a huge amount of population growth, but all relatively within the natural confines. And you can just see here, there's 4% of the planet has been put down to crops. And then we started to do grazing. But you can also see that we've, we've eaten into the natural world. We've started to, to come into conflict with it, perhaps. But we're certainly making an impression on it. And that's a pattern that we continue. Oh, we'll go back. Ah, I knew that was going to happen. You see, this is what happens when you press the button. So here we are. 2018, it's the last one of these things. So you can see how the humans, there was 7.7 .7 billion then. So we've added a few more in the intervening years. But you can see how, how the, the grassland areas, the steppes and those savanna areas and in South America as well, they've, they've been reduced to a mere 14%. So that's 30% of that's gone. The forest has been significantly eaten into and again, you see that with the way in which it's going on with, with the um, loss of the Amazon today. But let's face it, you know, we were in the, our push to civilise Britain in the third, fourth century, or sort of millennium BC, you know, we were doing a fair amount of that ourselves. And then we've got the cropland and we've got the grazing land. So this is what we now use to feed ourselves. And this is what we use to feed the, the eight billion offers, which is quite a large amount people. And again, again, another graph. I told you you've had enough of these. But what is actually impressive is how, whilst the amount of land available to agriculture has sort of not really done much for quite a while. Yes, we increased it with mechanisation and with deforestation and bringing in you know, most of America's and, and Russia and those larger areas. That's keeping this huge population going and production itself has increased as well. So we've done very well at it. You know, we've been good at it. You know, it's something that we've actually excelled at. And um, I think, okay. So I want to then bring you in a little bit closer into what's happening in, in UK agriculture, what's happening in, at home. Uh, this is a nice little shot from one of my favourite farmers, who's a big organic farm on the Wiltshire, Hampshire border, Stonehenge is a few miles down there, but he's got this lovely mixed farm. He's got a few weeds growing in, a, in his barley. He's got a crop there. He's got sheep, he's got cows. The sad thing is, is that's quite unusual. For a lot of farms, we've got a different structure. And so it's useful for us to understand how much of the country and how much land and what we're using and what, what's the, um, 
the resource that we use and we can feed ourselves on. And so this was all taken from Dimbleby's food strategy report. He's got some wonderful graphics in there. So what he's done is really swept up all the areas and said, right, this is, this is what you're going to do. So in this little area here, this is if we swept all the gra uh, ground growing cereals together, you get that. Now, I'm not, I'm not convinced his built-up area is as big as this, but obviously he's got access to better information than me. However, I think it's different. But what you can see is that the way in which we've got woodland is this top end here. So that's all the woodland we have, and that's about 14%, 15% of the country. Um, you've got golf courses. He's obviously decided to single out. But they do actually... There's a bigger area than the potato growers of this world. So this is kind of showing that we have to make compromises and we have to, to sort of get along with each other. But the biggest land use really is all of this lot to do with animal production and then the poultry over here as well. And then just down here, I'm saying that the utilizable agricultural area, so that's how much we can use is 17.2 million hectares. The countryside is, the country in total is about 24 million. So we've got about 70%, which is available for agriculture. Now you've got peat and things like that built up, golf courses, etc. And off that area, 3.2, so that's 13% is what we grow the cereals on. So that's that bit there. And then all the seed rape is a little bit, you know, it, it comes and goes. There was a time when there's a lot more of it being grown, but it's gone down with a few pests and people aren't quite as um, happy to grow it. And I think, you know, they, 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 were, they were doing it badly. They were bringing in the, the rotations were much too short. And as a consequence, nature did quite well. And then we've got a big lump of grassland, which is this lump here, which is everything from highly productive silage ground, which is trying to get you know, sort of 10, 15 tonnes of silage down to the little bit which is grazed. But there's always a but in these things. That's not all that we need. And if we can press the button and we get, ah, there we go. We also borrow other people's land, the so-called ghost acres. So to feed us and our, our, all our animals and our things, we have to have this amount of land is offshored. So you can understand with the fruit and vegetables, you know, things coming in from Spain, and we get a lot of Dutch tomatoes, and then we get lots of blueberries from Peru and places like that. So you can understand where some of this is coming from. And the poultry feed is probably mostly, and pig feed mostly, linked in with the 3.3 million tonnes of soya that we're importing. So we're importing a lot of food, all to be grown somewhere else. So you can see that, you know, we are, we are kind of, in some respects, living beyond our capabilities and our means. But that's, you know, we've got a big planet to go at. And with the global trading systems, we don't just have to live on our little island on our own. Then let's see if we look at the next set of data graphs. Now, I'm sure that you all have sort of worked out that there's a lot of arable cropping in East Anglia, which is all this little bit here. But what is also quite interesting is how much Lincolnshire into Yorkshire it goes. And then we can follow our little bit here, the line of the Chilterns just about coming in into Hampshire, Isle of Wight, Big and Kent. So that's where, that's where the cereals are going. That's where wheat is being grown. And then just as a bit of a um, uh, comparison, I just picked out the sheep. Okay, it's, it's, it's a little lighter day of the data. Problem is, is that you, they don't visualise this data like this anymore. And when you find something, you think, aha, that's good, I'll have some of that. But then they don't do it anymore. So I'm afraid to say that we, have, we are stuck with a little bit of old data here. And things have moved on a bit. But you can kind of see that the sheep are up in Cumbria, up in the North Country... In the sort of Shropshire area, down here in Cornwall and Dartmoor, and then we've got the ones in Kent. So that gives you an idea that, that the country is east for arable, west for, for, for livestock. Now, that's, it didn't used to be like that. Now, we used to have much more mixed farming, but economics, and you can see, you know, when you're trying to drive a £300,000 combine, that the small wet fields down here, no way can they afford that. So they've just given up on it. They just buy the stuff in from over here. And that in itself has got problems, but we might look at that, some of those later. But yes, the idea of mixed farming, that's, you know, small farms relatively 
balanced agricultural systems, that's gone, unfortunately, because of the way in which economics is driving them and the labour profile as well and the ageing population. Whew. So I just thought I'd come out and see if we can find a little bit what's going on in your patch of the world. You know, it's a different set of data derived from satellite imagery, so from the Corrine land cover maps, and this is for South Oxfordshire. They've, they've done it for every administrative area in the country. And you can immediately see, we've kind of got a split here. What's got, you know, you've got this little bit here. This is the hills at the back of, of the town and the Chilterns. You can see that you've got more woodland, which is there. And then you've got a lot of arable going through the area and a little bit more sort of, of in the way of pasture. But you can see the split, how it, it's working there. So you basically, and I remember as well, is a predominantly arable landscape with cereals as your number one crop. And you are then with a few bits of, of, um, uh, of pasture around. And then it gives you the idea along here of just how much tree cover you've got. Not huge, is it? But um, that's what you have. Now, that's, that's a result of the way that the landscape has been farmed over the years. And it's a result of hundreds of years of activity to start off with. And then in the last 50, 60, 70 years since World War II, and probably a bit beforehand, there's been an intensification in it. So let's have a look at, say, how we are doing. Now, I always like to have a little bit of a picture. So we're going to be looking at historic wheat yields. What were we growing? And any of the local historians tell me when was the first... Well, I'm sort of mention of Watlington. How far back does the, do, do we go here? I know you're in the Doomsday Book, and obviously churches like this don't just happen on their own, but how far back do we, can we go with the village or the town? All right, well. Okay, because you, you've got, you've got, you had at the back of the, back there, you've got the Ekneald Way, haven't you? So that's going to be Stone Age. And then to what extent were they coming down into this sort of heavier ground? And then you've got the Romans at Dorchester. So you've probably got you know, the best part of two, 3,000 years worth of human activity. But um, the figures we can pull out, we can't pull out what was going on in the Roman times, but we can pull out records of what we had going on at other times. So this is for the national. This isn't just going to be for you, but um, you can kind of see... <laughs> How we've, how we've improved the yield. So 0.4 of a tonne a hectare. It's not a lot, is it? A hectare being 100 metres by 100 metres, two and a half acres to the hectare. Now, that's easy enough to understand. And an acre being a chain by a furlong, to 22 by... <laughs> yes. And then we've got chains, we've got furlongs. But anyway, you, you, you know... We're, we're, we're all in, in hectares. If you start talking to people in, in, in acres, you know, oh, all my young colleagues look at me as if I'm sort of going off on one. And then when I was an agronomist, we, we had this litres per hectare, which is what it was on the bottle. But we had some of the elderly farmers wanted it in fluid ounces per acre. So I then had to get all the conversion factors. But we are, we're all metric, and it kind of works. We understand what we're doing. But you can see that right up in that 1600, so think about our earlier Bruegel painting, what would have been somewhere about there, you weren't getting a huge amount of, of, of yield. And then as we start to get a little bit more technolo technologically au fait, we got a little bit more. The fourth course rotation, Jethro Tull and his seed drill. And then it started to ramp up a bit, fertilizers. Now that's, that's a key one there. You know, in and around this era now, this was when they would have been sending boats around to the Pacific Islands to mine guano, which was the accreted seabird droppings for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And when they found that, it was a great fertiliser. So off they went, loads of boats, loads of boats went over there and mined it, and it was all gone. Oh, a bit of a problem here. But luckily, luckily, we had a... a a couple of cunning Germans came up with a cunning plan. Mr. Harbour and Mr. Bosch, or could have been Dr. Harbour and Dr. Bosch, you know, without clever people. And that's when they started to synthesise atmospheric nitrogen into ammonium nitrate. 
Now, originally, it wasn't necessarily for the good of humanity they wanted to do this. They wanted to make better explosives. And ammonium nitrate is a very powerful explosive in its own right, but it was also the feedstock for other things. But we got fertilisers out of it, and then we got more fertilisers, and we got pr progress. And so by the year 2000 or so, we got about two and a half, we got about eight tonne a hectare, which is just over three tonne an acre, or 60, 100 weight an acre. And then if we want to look at how the world is doing that, you know, that's us in isolation, and we can sort of follow this, this sort of path of people improving. Yes, this is us. And we have the ups and downs. There are good years and bad years. Now, this is weather-related and very much an indication of the problems you get with, with our variable climate. Even with all our fancy technology, you can't control the weather. And if it goes down... It's, it will fall over. So I think that might be 1984. Oh, no, 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 no. When was that? So let's have a think. That, all right, that was the year I first was an agronomist. That was 84. We had some brilliant yields then. It was easy. And then we had dips, you can see anyway. But what is also interesting is the way that countries such as China have developed from basically a ton of hectare up to six tons now, huge improvements, but then they need to. You, know, you look at the size of the population, they need to grow all this stuff. But you do wonder if, if this is without some cutting of corners. Canada has always been this sort of bread basket. We've always imported Canadian hard wheat to make our fancy bread, and that's sort of moved up. And Ethiopia, again, thinking about it, was always been strong from, you remember, 86, 86, was it 86, the Live Aid event? and the way in which you know, those harrowing pictures brought home of how dependent these societies are on, on, on agriculture. And they, they, they seem to be getting their act together. And what is also is that they're as good as the Australians are. Hmm. Well, you know, that's always good to have one. So let's have a look at where all this wheat is coming from and how much we're doing and all that sort of stuff. And I think, all right, let's do it like that. So we've always, and again, when people show you this sort of thing, oh, I didn't know that. I always, you know, before I started doing all of this thing, oh, yeah, America, breadbasket of the world. They make all our wheat. Yes, 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 yes. Well, not really. China is by far the biggest producer of wheat, followed by India and then Russia. Now, this is interesting because of this, the time scale. It's 20 years average. And I would suggest that Russia is a lot better than that. And, oh, there's always one. The Ukraine, you can see that, you know, obviously the problems in the Ukraine, big producers of wheat. And this is us over here. This is the Britain, 2.2%. And you can see on a global scale, every year we have, you know, we've been getting, about, getting a bit better. 780 million tonnes is a heck of a lot of wheat. But we need it because there's a heck of a lot of people. And this is what we do in the UK. And you can kind of see, you know, the, the summer of 2020, most people will say it's a bit wet and a bit miserable. But for your farming community, it was hideous. It rained practically every day in, in, in August. Or if it didn't rain every day, it rained every other day. And the consequence of that was it really knocked the yields and what was going on in the spring. So, you know, this is where climate change starts to, or the more variable climate starts to impact upon us and starts to have a go. And it makes us realise that we might not be the masters of what we think we've got. So, you know, obviously, when we are producing all this inputs and we're pushing what are natural systems far harder than nature intended, then it's going to have a consequence. Now, you might think, oh, this is a lovely view. This is just round the corner from Watership Down. Watership Down is over here somewhere. You've all read the book. Of course you have, or you've read it to your kids and traumatised them by watching the, um, the cartoons. But this is around the corner from Warship Downs. So this is, this is the open downland countryside of Hampshire, the Wessex Downs. And you can see big open fields. And not that long ago, this would have been grass. This was, this was on some older maps. This is down, known as Litchfield Down. And look at it now. There's not a blade of grass there. There's nothing growing in it. It produced a great crop of oats, lovely crop of oats, which then get obviously put, fed into either the human consumption or they go to horses. But this is the consequence of, of the systems we have. You can see very little in the way of hedges. There's one there. 
Okay, this area perhaps would not have been very hedged, but it is quite an open landscape. And even though, and this is, this is one of the questions we might want to look at, even though the farmer is relatively sympathetic to nature, you know, he, he, he tries his bit, he's got some nice grassland, he's got water shipped down, for instance, cropped areas like this offer very little opportunity for nature to thrive and survive in, because there's nothing growing there. And it's not just the stuff which is going on there with the green, the, the bits there, it's also the stuff underground. So, mm, let's have a think on that one. But before we can do that, we'll have to, you know, looking at the future of farming, I think, you know, what we have to also be very conscious of is that we have got very changeable weather. But there are some trends here which I think are inescapable, is that it's getting hotter, you know, as a kid, we used to, uh, we had some great time sledging up in Bolton on the moors and stuff like that when it was cold. But you can see how that that sort of shift is pushing that temperature. And with that temperature, you're getting effects on agriculture. You're getting effects also in what I think is going to be the wider natural systems. So here we go. So this is just one year. And this is, this is I pinched this slide from a friend of mine who works for the Forestry Commission. But... Basically, it's showing just how much warmer it was in the winter months in that year, particular year, across the whole nation and up in Scotland, significantly warmer. Now, if you happen to be a small plant, which is some, some of these sort of, which live on the tops of Scottish mountains, you can't go anywhere. And when it warms up, which you don't want it to do, you want it cold. Well, you've got nowhere to go. This year, I think, up in Fort William was the first year for many, many years when there was no snow cover, none whatsoever, in Fort William upon Ben Nevis. Now, that's not happened that frequently. And you're looking at the demise of the glaciers. Hmm. So anyway, so this is kind of looking at the way in which temperatures from what were considered to be a long-term average have changed in the second half of the season. Across the whole country, we're seeing a significantly warmer April and March. Now, if you're a bumblebee and you still want to hibernate and you want to sort of keep in March, it don't want to come out, you might have a problem. But you do start to notice things working in the natural world which are responding to this warming climate. And this is budburst and oak. So this is just something that people have long-term recorded. And in the 1950s, it was, you know, just about early, early May. And here we are, a number of years later, you can push the, draw the line, join the dots, and it's a month earlier. So have a look at that come May, come, come April, when is your bud burst going to happen on your, on your oaks? Again, all that is driving some changes with, that, with the natural systems. It's all having an impact on the way that, that um, nature responds to it and then of course with farming just as a slight aside we had one variety of winter barley which was really early and it grew like stink one year and then we had frosts big frosts and inside the developing plant the frost had killed practically all the developing ears so even though it's looking great on the outside when it came to to um producing the ear there was hardly anything there and you went from what would have been about a six ton, seven ton crop to be lucky to be scraping two or three. From a farming point of view, but a disaster. So, you know, this is where it's climate change and this variability is starting to hit us. So, how's agriculture impacting on climate change? Now, what are we doing? So, how is agriculture how do you know what's it adding to this you know every sector in the is is contributing some sort of greenhouse gas and one of the things that we had to do when i was uh, in defra was to start looking at how we are going to have a climate change reduction program now we've got in law we've got these mandatory targets that we've got you know, to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 2050 and it's not just going to happen overnight. So we started to work out what it is we can do to within the sector. And every industry is doing this. So the transport industry, the, the electricity, you name it, they're all doing it. And they've got carbon budgets, CBs. 
and we're on to CB3 at the moment. And we've got some way to go, but um, it's gonna, we're going to struggle a little bit, I think. However, so this is across the world, is that the fall of the supply chain for food and the livestock and the crops and the land use, we produce around a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions globally are coming from agriculture. Hmm, something must be done about it. And just as a, as a, to put the in context, global greenhouse gas emissions are 50 billion, and we're about, well, that many million, just under 1%. But if you also look at the cumulative amount of emissions that the UK have produced over the years, and this is what they're arguing about at COP at the moment, of trying to work, work out the way in which these things have been, uh, should be accounted for and should be accommodated in the international settlements, some of that goes on. But you can kind of see you know, that livestock is a big contributor and you've got land use for livestock and you've got animals for livestock. So it's one of those things is that what can we do to reduce our collective emissions so that one is that we become more carbon neutral and that we also start to rein back and try our best to keep the um, greenhouse gas emissions to within manageable, and that's the inverted commas there, but I don't know that we know what's going to happen with a 1.5 degrees increase. And then just looking at, at um, what we do here in, in, in the UK, I've nicked this slide from the good Becky Wilson. She doesn't know about it. She works for a little company called the Farm Carbon Toolkit, and they talk to farmers so that they can work out their own carbon emissions, and so they can you know, do, do the sort of audit and some of this is actually helping them in the marketplace now because they can access or some of the, uh, the larger retailers want to see a carbon audit. They want to see how, how people are producing food. And so it's all starting to, to sort of get this change in, in agriculture and, and the farming community. And as you can see, as you can see, okay, these are just pie graphs. So we're not looking at any quantities, but we're looking at proportions. And from our arable farmers here, the biggest proportion of their greenhouse gas it comes from fertilizer. Oh dear. So, you know, if you think about the vast amount of energy that is required to do one of these cracking plants where they, they squash the gases together at high pressures, it takes a huge amount of energy. And when, when that then releases, this is nitrous oxide dioxide that gets up into the atmosphere. That's where arable farming has its biggest impact. And, you know, you look at the field use and operations, that's the tootling around on tractors. Well, with the price of diesel now, I think the idea of recreational tillage, oh, just do a bit of rolling, keep, keep the student out of mischief, that's kind of gone by the by. And a lot of farmers are really costing out every last field pass. And they'll say, no, it's not worth it. So this is probably going to come down. And then you've got the other bits. Now, what is actually the smallest proportion of, of the arable input is the crop protection, the pesticides, the agrochemicals. That's a teeny weeny little bit really. And yet you know, a lot of people fixate on those thinking that's where all the energy is and that's where all the badness comes. And then when we're into the animal stuff, well essentially it's all to do with being an animal. The methane, the fermentation in, in, in cow's guts, you know, they're forever burping burping vast amounts of methane. Now, when I was a student, I shared a house with a laddie. He's now Professor Newbold and he works up in Scotland. And he spent his 40 years career, and he got to be a professor, working on reducing the methanogenesis from enteric fermentation. And he was actually getting huge amounts of research grants and, and money from some of the oil majors at one point, because they thought if we can crack the methane in cow's stomachs, we can offset our production with that. I'm not sure it worked out. But you can see, you can see though, that is, that's something there. Now, there are ways and means to reducing that. It's not the end of the world. So we can do something about that. And similarly, with manures, you know, when you have these manure heaps, vast amounts of ammonia is, is coming off. Again, they, they, you know, things can be done that. And there's government grant aid at the moment to improve your manure storage so that we're not having 
clouds of greenhouse gases coming up from your stalls. And I suppose we also have to look at this thing about greenhouse gas equivalents. Now, I know this is an agriculture talk, and I'm banging on about climate change, but it is so linked. You cannot divorce one from the other. Everything that goes on in agriculture has got linkages into this climate thing. And we, you know, we are desperately trying to reduce those things. But you've just got this thing about the potency. And you all have seen the figures that nitrous oxide is significantly more potent than carbon dioxide, which is this little one over here, and methane. It's a bit more complicated. And some people, you know, you, you talk to some people, they'll, they'll be less het up about methane because it's got a short-ish half-life. But I say we haven't got 100 years or 50 years. We've got to do something fairly soon. So we need to do something about it. But you can kind of see that the biggest contributions are coming from the methane, which we've just sort of said is, is linked in with animals. And then we've got the, the um, nitrous oxide linked in with fertiliser usage. So we need to look at them. Now just moving tack a little bit about human environmental damage and that was one of the risks that we were looking at it was one of the risks in, in this top corner this is a wonderful set of long-term data taken by, on the river thames just north of london going back to just about the 1860s and this was recording the nitrate concentration in the river thames from then into into our era now and you can see great you know, not a lot happens in the first sort of 50, 60, 70 years, and then it sort of ekes up, ekes up, ekes up. And with the agricultural intensification in the 70s, bang! Oh dear, lots of nitrates in the River Thames. Now, what about, what does that do? Well, it does this. That's the Solent, that's somewhere in America. And the final one is somewhere in China. So that's, on, that's just out you know, by the seaside. I did have a group of Chinese um, academics come round the farms once because they are absolutely you know, really concerned about the way in which the nitrate pollution is getting out of hand, and that's what it's doing. And so if you happen to be a, 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 an avocet or something wanting to have a mooch around here to find yourself a worm or something, it's going to be difficult. If you're a hotelier on here having some, uh, would you want to swim in that? Not really. I'd go somewhere else. And if you're a little fisherman trying to do something... So it's a worldwide problem. It's not just UK. So we're not alone, as you can see, but it's something too. And then we're moving on to that topic of atmospheric pollution, air quality. It's starting to be a little bit more talked about now. And this is, this is what's left in the rain. So you can see we've got areas in the country. This is around Cheshire with all those animals. Northern Ireland's got a huge livestock industry. And a lot of their stuff apparently gets picked up on the wind and ends up in other places. So this is the, what's happening with the amount of nitrous in, uh, nitrates in, in the rain. You think, well, so what? But this is where it's impacting upon what we see here. You know, you think about on, on the hills at the back of town, you've got chalk grassland, beautiful chalk grassland. Pristine, you think it is. You know, this is, this is probably the most species-rich habitat we have. In, in England. Absolutely brilliant. But look about what happens when you start getting nitrate and nitrogen deposition. In the natural system, you've got this diversity here. So this is diversity. This is the number of species. And then as soon as you start to, uh, to dribble on through in rain, drip, 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 species diversity drops. That's the consequence. That's the consequence of our, our obsession with nitrates. OK, we need nitrates for food, but do we need as many? And then looking across the globe, we're not alone. State of declining biodiversity. And what's the reason for that? Each of these nations, you know, you could say that in Europe, we've been at it for long enough, so we've, we haven't got much nature left to destroy, hence the only 24%. Whereas places like Africa and Latin America, you're starting from a much higher point. But land use change, this is what we do, this is how we farm. That's the big driver. Okay, in Africa, you're getting more of an impact because of exploitation and poaching and all that sort of stuff which goes on people needing to feed themselves. And a bit of bushmeat, etc., is, is something they do. But you can see that the land use change, much of it linked in with agriculture, is impacting on us. Now, I'm sure you'll have seen this data. 
It is actually a bit out of date because it's 2013, I noticed that. However, you can see the way that farmland birds, these are your linnets, these are your yellowhammers, your skylarks, your bullfinches, you know, all those sorts of things, your grey partridges, all those things are really being impacted upon by the way in which agriculture is in, in, I'll say interfering, but you know, interacting with, with the natural environment. And it is the farmland birds which seem to be the ones most at threat. And what we do, okay, if we, if we run that line along a bit, you know, we've been doing agri-environment for since about here, and still the decline is happening. But if we run the line along, I know it doesn't sound very grand or very brilliant, but I think we've just about stabilised the decline. Hardly what you might call a grand achievement just to stop it getting any worse. But that's, what's, that's what we're doing. And then the final little bit in this sort of rather depressing section is... Insects. Now, this is the splatometer. Now, people have used this to measure the number of insects. They put grids on the front of cars and then after a while measure how many insects they have collected, have been splatted on their grid. And as a consequence, it gives them an idea of what's flying around. Now, I don't know where on earth this was taken because I don't remember for a long time having to scrape any insects off the front of my car and you probably remember when you pull into the, you know, the petrol station one of the things you do would get the squeegee out to get rid of them on your windscreen so that's not the case anymore is it and this isn't just in the UK it's all across sort of northern Europe and in other geographies and what is causing that and why is it that our insect numbers are plummeting because insects, as we, as we all be aware of, are in the food chain, at the bottom of the food chain. Well, you could say it's my, microbes are, but you know, they are the next step up. And if we're knocking out the insects in our food chain, then you know, your birds are going to struggle. What are they going to eat? And practically every bird, I think somebody said, there was it corn buntings and cell buntings, but every bird feeds its young on live insects, larvae and, and beetles. So if we don't have those in abundance in a food chain, then we're going to struggle with the things further up the food chain, which is going to be our farmland birds, hence the decline in farmland birds. And what's causing this vast decline in insect numbers? Well, you can kind of see, again, it's the agricultural sector, the intensification. If you remember that picture I showed you about what was happening on Watership Down, not a, not a green thing to be seen. So whilst you're not actively killing off your insects, because the farm manager there, Joe, he said he's not used an insecticide for 10 years on the farm. So he hasn't done any spraying for insects yet without the weeds, without the things upon which the, um, the insects can feed on. Well, you know, they just starve. Pesticides, as you can imagine, have an impact. And then we're looking, I don't know what ecological traits are, but urbanisation, you know, the way that we have built over large areas of the land. I d I'm not showing it here, but there was a, a bit of data, and I think it's worthwhile remembering, that in Buckinghamshire, where there was more detailed data available as to what was happening, 6% of Buckinghamshire is gardens. Hmm. So everybody's got a garden, what can you do for that? So, you know, there are things we can do. I did see something from some of the beekeepers who reckon that beehives in good urban areas with good diverse flowers are yielding just as well as some of the beehives in the wider countryside. Quite remarkable if you think about it. So whilst the urban area is a decline, is, is there helping in the decline of these things? I think there's a lot that we can do with ourselves, our bee friendly plants and those sorts of things. And my wife sometimes, I think, despairs of my laissez-faire attitude with gardening. It's not because I'm lazy, you know, I used to do quite a lot of it, but I've, I'm doing a little bit of rewilding. I'm certainly not cutting the lawn with, well, I call it grass, it's not a lawn anymore. I leave bits to do their own thing. So I'm doing my bit, and I've even counted the various weeds which are in it and sent them off to plant life. And then they tell me that my, that my lawn is average. Huh. Anyway, so there are things that we can do, but you can kind of see, you know, the impact that agriculture is having here. You add that to that, you've got this one here, which is the, you know, 
fertilizers and you've got something a bit of deforestation as we nick a bit of more land for it and you can see that it's impacting on, on, on insects and there was a really scary bit of work they did in Germany on the middle of a, a um, nature reserve miles from anywhere long-term monitoring and even this nature reserve in the middle of nowhere was struggling with its insect numbers and that does make you really you know, wonder what is going on it's going to be multifactorial of course with weather but I do think there's, there's, there's a big impact that we have as humans. So, something must be done about it. And this is where, you know, this is where it gets all a bit exciting. In that, this is, this is a picture in front of what used to be my office in London, Marsham Street. And every now and again, you get these protests going on, which is fine, you've got no problem with that. And we sort of skulk in, doing your best not to, you know, and there'd be the police cordon, and you try your best to, to just get in without any... any letter hindrance or anything like that and then you've got the school strikes you know the uh, my kids are also in this sort of bracket here getting a little bit excited about things which is great but then i also do remind them that when you have switched the light switch on you must at the end of it switch it off you know don't don't forget about that bit because it all helps but you know and, and just as an example of how popular protest movements can have an impact on things in the 70s and early 80s in Germany, you had a really big anti-nuclear sort of campaign, Atomkraft, Nein Danke, and there were all these stickers everywhere. And as a consequence of that, the German government decided to shut it down, all its nuclear reactors. And even in the height of the energy crisis of last or earlier in the year, they're not shifting. So, if you think about protest movements, you think about the way in which people can influence things, then you think about the way that that all happened. They did make a difference. They changed things now. You know. And then you, you know, we have all this, you know, we used to do a lot of conversations with people like this. You know, it's the Soil Association got some really good people in there. You know, on one level, they are uh, the shop stewards for the organic movement, but on another level, they're clever people with, a, with good experience and knowledge about various things. Woodland Trust also with things. You know, Plant Life is probably my, my, one of my favourite um, little charities because in my days as an agronomist when I was out there selling pesticides I was killing these things. Sorry, you know, it's a confession time here. But um, we, we, we now try our best to remain and retain some of these um, rare arable plants. We used to call them weeds. And they are, in some respects, some of the most rare plants in the countryside. There's one which grows on a farm that I deal with near Basingstoke. It's the only site in the country where they've got this particular plant. Quite, you know, so we look after it. Anyway, so all of this lot here, and you get you know, the, the protest movements, the, the mood of the people, you've got the input of what we call the ENGOs, the Environmental Non-Government Organisations, leaf etc along with with the inputs from the farming lobby and the cla and all that lot end up in parliament and we try to sort of come up with ideas and that's why well, that's called policy now sometimes it works sometimes it's all insurmountable but it's all part of this the, the process and i'll be quick on this one because you don't need to read any of this but you know, you know we're here at the moment oh it's nothing there there's nothing there at the moment, everybody's going on about the COPs, COP26 and COP27. This is these international get-togethers. Okay, that helps set the domestic agenda for the political agenda at home. So, yes, you know, if you're an Indian or you're a Chinese person, you know, you're going to have to sell this idea to your populace that we're going to cut down on our greenhouse gases. But all of these things, you know, from all the various things you've seen, the whaling convention, CITES, there's one. I was talking to a chap the other day, he's an antiques dealer and he sells antiques ivory. He said that every now and again they have to test their ivory to make sure that it's antique because anything since which was made post-1947 is radioactive because of the nuclear bombs and it's, it's picking it up in ivory. There's a thought. So here in, in Britain, or here in England, I should say, because with the devolved things, we came up with a 25-year environmental plan. And it's the first time we've ever had one of these. It's looking at a long-term plan. It's trying to stitch together all these different competing things. 
And so, you, you know, from a farming point of view, what have we got, which is kind of good? Well, it's all kind of good. You know, using resources from nature more sustainably and efficiently, that sounds grand. Adapting and mitigating to climate change, it's all feeding in. So we have to sort of think about these things. We've got to bring these things on board and when we do, you know, what we think about. And then some of these things get translated into laws and regulations, which is a lot of people think, oh, that's an imposition. Why do I have to do that? Well, they're there for the reason. They're there for, oh, you're coming good. But here's an interesting one. You know, you've all heard about the Corn Laws and how they, they were protectionist and with the abolition of them in the 1870s, booming trade. But the Preservation of Grain Act from 1532, and it was amended in 1566. So that was Henry VIII did that one, and then Queen Elizabeth I, she did the one over there. This has nothing to do with preserving grain. Well, they thought it did. But you got a bounty for every head of the thing that you could give. So things such as sparrows, I think you got 12 sparrows, heads got you a penny. You got four pence for a hedgehog, a fox got you a shilling, a stoat got you tuppence, and this and, and the bizarre thing was they set quotas to little villages, so there would have been a quota, and there was probably a record kept here in Watlington about how many of these things you had handed in, and obviously you then sort of made a bit of money on them. And the consequence of that was that they absolutely decimated the natural populations of, of these things. And as an example of how that's not a good idea, you just got to look to the 1960s in China when they were struggling with one of their famines or their, their sort of human created ones, you have to say. So the whole idea was that you were killing all the songbirds and every kid in every village would be running around with a stick, beating it, and eventually all the songbirds just died of exhaustion. They just had enough. They couldn't feed, they couldn't sleep, they couldn't do anything because it would be onto them. Well, the year after that, there was a plague of locusts. You know, they'd eaten all the predators, everything which was doing it all gone. So that is, you know, anyway, that's a little aside. But we still have, and this is a weird thing is, I was at a meeting with some European colleagues up in Edinburgh a couple of weeks ago, looking at you know, bringing back biodiversity bird life onto farms. And, and they used the, the grey partridge as the example, because the grey partridge is one of these sort of peak birds. If you do it right for grey partridge, everything else will be good. And then the, the fraught question of predator control came up, because in Holland, you can't do predator control. It's against the law. They don't do that sort of thing, whereas the Germans, they're quite happy doing that sort of thing. And you know, we were looking at, about these things, about if you do predator control, you know, all the business. And I just said, look, guys, we've been doing this for 500 years. We've been hammering foxes for 500 years and, and magpies and things like that, and they're still at it. So anyway, right, so just as a quick one, we're just about pushing through, we just pushed through what we call the 21 Environment Act. Great. Legally binding targets on air quality, biodiversity, water resource, and waste reduction. Now, this is an interesting one. A legally binding target? How do you, how do, you, how do, you do that? So I'm really intrigued how that is going to land. How are we going to, to do that? How are we going to, to, to make that work? And you can see the other ones. This is another one which might be of interest for people in the vicinity, is the local nature recovery strategies, LNR assays. They all just fall off, trip off the tongue, these things, don't they? But this is going to be where every local authority will have to have a biodiversity plan which looks at things in a sort of a, a spatially, not just if you're doing one little development over there, that's fine. It's going to be what will that development do with the others? And it's all this interlinkage stuff. Landscape scale is what they call it. And as you can see, that all developers will need to do a, a net gain increase. So you've got to offset your, your um, developments. Now, I don't know if there's a de minimis. What happens if you're doing an extension, for instance? Is that a development? Ooh. Anyway. And so here are just some of the targets which are in the thing. And we all know that government loves a good target. We all like a target. But, you know, so the target, the first one we have, which is really making us think, how on earth are you going to decline the species, decline in species abundance by 2030? Now, you could say that they've already rigged this one, because as I said before, we probably just about stopped the decline in farmland birds. And that's because we've been doing stuff in the fields for quite a while. 
But here's the one which they're going to really struggle with, is get them to be 10% greater in 2024. Hmm. And we've got things about, you know, just habitat, we need a lot more of it. 50, 30, half a million hectares, that's not an inconsiderable amount of area. Where's the food going to come from? So we've got a bit of a conflict there, haven't we? And then this one is the water quality stuff. You know, that's more from farming, but you've got the ones in treated wastewater. So we've got to have huge reductions in phosphate coming out of our sewage works. And if you've been following the press, they're struggling with, with sewage and, and, um, out, and these flood events. So there's some challenging targets there, many of which are going to impact on farming. So if we're looking about the future of farming, how is that going to work? How will farming have to react to these things? How will farming be able to take advantage of them? If you're a farmer, you've got land. You can sell some of your land to the developer. You can offset using your land. There's an economic opportunity there, maybe. So I'll just quickly look at you know, a couple of things which I think have had big impacts on the way that the landscape looks, the 47 Agriculture Act and joining the common market in 73, both of which pushed agricultural intensification quite high. I'm not sure what this character is doing, but why would you want to plough the riverbank out? I don't know. But um, he's having a go. He's got a tractor and it's nice and shiny and he's never done it before. So we, we, we sort of then bring in with these things the whole idea of subsidies and support. You know, we can't call it subsidy, we've got to call it support because that's kind of more acceptable. But, you know, reality is it's a big amount of money which has been spent, much of it without any form of of requirement you know and you could argue that the food production system requires that but then other people will say subsidies have distorted the food production so we had all these things you know we saw in 73 we joined up we had butter mountains and grain mountains and all that stuff and then over time they've been manipulating them so that you know in 2015 you don't actually need to do it's decoupled that means you just need to own the land and then we've got Brexit, which has thrown a certain spanner in the works. But uh, that's the way it is. And then alongside that, we have what we were calling the agri-environment scheme. So this is where I sort of come in from work. You know, I'll go on to a farm and we can talk about the environmental opportunities that you've got on a farm and what it is they want to do. So it's voluntary, so you don't have to do it. But if you want to do it, then it's great. You know, we're, we're there to help and we'll pay you on an income foregone basis. So you're not going to make much money out of it. But if you're clever, you can do a little bit and you can you know, not necessarily take large amounts of the farms out, but you can do something on the farm. So we first started these things in 87. Essentially, a group of farmers went off to government and said, why are you paying us to drain the fens in Norfolk? Surely you should be paying us to keep them. Bit of head scratching, and they said, yeah, good idea. And so that's when the environment sensitive areas came along. You know, the Upper Thames tributaries around here was, was part of it. The Test Valley was part of it. The South Downs were part of it. But they were just specific areas. And so we broadened that out in 91 to call current size stewardship. Little specific ones, hedger incentive, 94, hub scheme. And this is the big one. This is where it really became much bigger uptake by a lot more farmers in 2005 with the ELS and HLS. Now, you know, I'm talking in acronyms because that's what I do all the day long, HLS, ELS, HAB scheme. You, know. you, you, you slip into it. But the one which is the interesting acronym is ELMS. And when we were discussing how should we name this thing, one of the, um, the ministers said, we can't call our premier agricultural support scheme after a dead and dying tree. Well, they were overridden. And I did show up at the meeting and said, well, actually, we do have access now to some very resistant elm trees. We, we can bring those in and we can put them in and they are absolutely resistant to, to, to Dutch elm disease and we can get over that. So we, we can move on. But elms is sort of based on this concept of public goods, whereas before all the other things was just own the land. If you own the land, you get the money. Great, you know. Two billion pounds a year, choof, straight at the door. So we're now starting to see, well, what do we get for that money? How do we, how do we sort of improve a bit more of a, a 
sort of outcome for it. Now, it is a difficult one, especially when you've had 50 years of agricultural support and before that, the 47 Act was also in it. So it's going to be this moment of transition. But you can see that public goods can mean many things to many people. So it's access to the countryside, it's air quality, it's growing trees. You know, those are all public goods. Then there is always the question of public goods and private goods. You know, should we pay, for instance, this farmer here on this bit of land public money to rectify what is essentially the result of their you know, yeah, it was a bad management? And you can see soil erosion, soil wash, there's a little stream down here. That will be full of nutrients, that will be full of laden with, with sort of phosphate, etc. You know. That's a private good. But I think, you know, you've got to encourage people. You can't always be a big stick. You can't always look at them and say, you know, it's all your fault. We've got to help them along. And that's where, you know, that's going to be a, a different tone, I think, in conversations in, in, in coming up. And then we're not the only people now who are involved in using the natural environment to provide benefits. And this is Southern Water. So there's Mark, he, works, he used to be one of my colleagues, he jumped ship and worked with a water company. Nature-based solutions is what we're calling it, it's because you know, by growing this thing here, now this looks rather miserable, it doesn't look anything, but it's a cover crop. And again, you know, 20 years ago, nobody was growing cover crops, maybe, maybe one or two sort of organic farmers were, but you know, the organic lot were always a little bit strange. So you know, we've taken on board, and, and the, the agriculture industry has certainly worked out that cover crops are good. You can see that you've got stuff for nature to scootle around in. You've got green material here, which is pulling up nitrates from the soil. And that's what they want, because not too many miles from this field, we have a borehole which sun water are having to spend three million quid on, probably a bit more than that now, to do a nitrate stripping plant on it. Because over the years, the water seeping down from agricultural land has got elevated nitrate levels beyond the 50 parts per million. Now, there's arguments as to whether or not 50 parts per million is, means anything, but we have it. That's the, that's the legal limit, and that's what the water company have to adhere to. And so one of, these, one of the boreholes is off, off already because it's over limits, and now they're putting in this money. So what they're doing now is planning for 30 years' time so when the the nitrate stripping plant has reached the end of its life and it's going to cost them £300,000 a year to run. Ooh, that's an expense. So that's why they're talking to the farmers in the vicinity to grow cover crops, to pull up the nitrates so that it stops it going into the aquifers. Nature-based solutions. And that, I think, is, is, is the way it's, you know, one of the things we can do. Because when we did the sums, and we did the sums at head office, and we had all the things we want to be solved by nature and with all the things that we've got this sort of change in agriculture. So, you know, looking at the, the amount of um, carbon dioxide and things like that, it came to a huge amount of money, way more than we have, way more than the two billion quid or so we've got in the kitty, which is going to be divided up between new schemes, existing schemes, etc., etc. And just as a quick one, I know it's a graph again, but... This is what we were spending in Europe, but you can see that this is the amount of GDP percentage, and it's dropping. Even though the money's staying the same, it's dropping. And that's really what we, we don't want to be spending, the vast amount of public money, on supporting agricultural practices. And as a consequence, in the UK, now this is again going to cause quite a bit of heartache, it's going to cause some structural change, it's going to, is that the BPS, the basic payment system, which is... You know, the, the, the support payments, whereas in 2020 you're getting 23 grand because of the way it's tapering down, it, z it disappears in 2028. 20, now you could say well, that no other industry in the country gets that degree of support, so why is agriculture special and what is going to be different about it? So you can see that we are slowly transitioning away from a direct payment into payments for doing good things and you don't even need to look at this. Because it's all up in the air anyway. We had so much political change in the summer that what was the certainty when I was working with, with Secretary of State, before the Secretary of State? You know, we had this thing, and now there's, there's a lot of 
mm, so we just say a little bit of questioning and reviewing going on but we got we've got schemes and we've got stuff which are going to roll out and yes there will be something on offer and then you'll be able to access all this various funding because you know, we've got some um, schemes but you know just looking at it, it's the slurry investment thing that was i was saying about trying to reduce the amount of gases coming out from methanes you've got animal welfare now that again is a good thing if you can improve animal welfare you can improve the way in which these animals perform you get more performance for the same amount of feed you're reducing your carbon dioxide and methanes and here we are we've got some quite popular options you know this is this is sort of the history organic farming scheme esa cs and then when we introduced the hls huge amount of farms and let's face it that you know, we had about 90,000 up here so we got to cover about 70 percent of the countryside of all the eligible ground with schemes then unfortunately with the new schemes and the political shenanigans and all the nonsense which went that they lost popularity but they are picking up because without them you won't be able to access any of that cash and maybe you don't need it but a lot of people say they do so there's opportunities there so that's where the future i think is going to go now i just thought i'd show you some pictures of what we do because you know, here i am wittering on about various schemes and you're saying well what's all that about mm. it's juice not wine i can tell you anyway so for wild birds we produce these wild bird seed plots and this is areas dedicated to producing seed rich plants so this is quinoa with a bit of millet and the like now my ambition is to get rid of all these fancy foreign things and grow it all with native species which are then better suited to providing insect homes but from the point of view of if you think of it as a large bird's table and these things can be two three acres in size and in the winter months they can be absolutely laden with linnets and yellowhammers and these things really do help provide in that hungry gap and as said before agricultural systems are so clean and hygienic these days there's no food left for people I mean, you can't have a farmyard with a pile of grain in the corner anymore it's all got to be locked away because if you're if you're caught with open access grain storage in which the rats and the cats can get into then you, you you're not allowed to sell it so that's food source has disappeared from what used to be farmyards and many farmyards and you probably wandered around look like they're just you know, large industrial units with very big warehouses and grain stalls and very efficient but where's the space for nature where's that little bit of a pond and that puddle and that scratchy bit for birds so that's that's the the um the wild bird seed and this is in its second year a lot more feral a lot more broken down but good habitat brilliant habitat for beetles and that's where you get the food chain then we're doing stuff for pollinators we're encouraging farmers to do what we call herbal lays so it's a mixture of of clover with things such as sanfoin and and um what else we've got chicory and plantains good mix of things deep rooted very good at resisting drought and then we've got specific plots with clovers and the rest of it all aimed at giving your bumblebees somewhere to live and feed in the summer anybody's walk around the countryside will see the various margins we have six meter grass margins which are these ones some people say they're, Ooh, they're not very exciting but i think they're brilliant if you're a if you're a barn owl this is perfect hunting country you know if you're a barn owl you need to feed your little babies 30 shrews a day and that's what you've got to feed them and if you've got a full nest so where do you find them on things like this don't ever get reincarnated as a shrew i don't think because you'll be eaten by a barn owl but you know and then we've got these ones here this is for arable plants where they, they the weeds can grow this is with flowers in for your insects and this one is a beetle bank going through the middle of a field hence the the sort of telegraph poles and out of that your insect predators in the autumn can all come streaming out either side of it and you don't need to use insecticides what's not to like then we do also grassland big areas of grassland so we, we we pay farms to kind of be sympathetic with the management of the species rich stuff so this is some ancient and by ancient well over a thousand years old bit of grassland on the hampshire downs and we're also trying our best here to recreate stuff but well, this isn't particularly this isn't a good example because it's not particularly species rich 
But the whole idea of just putting things down to grass locks up carbon, takes out nitrates, gives certain birds somewhere to run around in. So it's a good thing. And then we've also got more ambitious projects, which is nature recovery. I was chatting earlier on. This is actually a farm which I used to be an agronomist on. And in 92, the owner said, I can't make money out of this. He had business interests he wanted to pursue. So he put it all down to one of these schemes. The whole lot went down. Yes, he did a bit of shooting, but that's all gone now. He sort of really turned quite green. And you can just see the amount of natural regeneration coming through here. And these are all birds that were on this thing. So stone curlew, there are about 300 pairs in, in the country. Before we did our schemes, there were 70. So that's an absolute success story. These are little long-eared owl chicks that he was have nesting in there. And then you've got some lapwing, it's all on this ex-arable land. So that's really nice. But people are going to say, what about the food? And yes, food production is something we still have to be mindful of. And so, you know, you... you this is where we're going to explore a bit of that. Now, much about food security, as with many of these things, is created by you know, the experiences that were happening in World War II. Basically, the U-boats were sinking all our shipping, and we had to send all the, the land girls out there to do the hard work. And then at the end of it, you had lots of, of, a, of um, displaced people and war refugees and that's one of the reasons why the common agricultural policy was created, was to create, was to, to add in a supply, a certainty of supply. However, you know, it, there are consequences of that. But we've become a little bit, sometimes a little bit obsessed with the concept of food security. Now, what do we mean by food security? Is it that we grow absolutely enough to feed ourselves in the country? Or is it something else? Because I said to one of my farmers, all well and good being food secure, but we do not, in the UK, produce a single combine harvester. Every combine harvester we have is imported. We import about 530 a year. And so without our combine harvesters, it doesn't matter how much you grow, you won't be able to cut it down. Yes, you could make, you could make a whole new factory somewhere. Who's going to pay for that? The reason that Ford left the UK was that it was losing them money. And the same with fertiliser production, the same with agrochemicals, and the same with many things. So the concept of food security is a very intertwined one. There's a romantic element that we all grow our own bits, and we've all seen the good life, and we all want to be like Tom and Barbara. But reality is we'll be like Margot and whatever his name was, the other chap. Anyway, so you can kind of see that you know, the World War, this, is, this really did sort of set the agenda. And then of, I, immediately after the war, we got into creating a lot of food. But the consequences of that was that we destroyed and took out a heck of a lot of natural vegetation, a heck of a lot of the things that made the countryside special. And it doesn't matter how many triple SIs you designate and how many bits and pieces, if you've knocked out the vast majority, you know, you're going to have a denuded and depleted environmental systems, you're going to struggle, things will be not connected, and when one site is damaged or, or something happens, populations will become remote or disappear. So looking at the whole business of food security, you know, we historically, it's in that sort of 60, 70 percent bracket. You know, we, we produce a reasonable amount of grub. We could produce more, but if you want to be importing tomatoes, is it better to import them from Spain than grow them in a greenhouse somewhere outside of Essex with lots of gas? So lots of questions about that. And then, of course, we cannot produce tea, we can't produce pineapples or anything like that, so we do just have to import food because we got used to it. You know, we, you, you go and look at the cheese aisle or, or whatever in Sainsbury's, and yes, you've got your lovely cheddar, and you've got your Lancashire, which everybody should eat, or Wensleydale, if you're Gwallis and Gromit. You've got all of that. But you also have Gorgonzolas, you've got your Emmentals, you've got 11 different sorts of hard mozzarella, of, of, hard, of hard cheeses, your Parmesans. So we do import food, and it's part of, you know, part of the food culture, I suppose, and we got used to it. And it would be really difficult to wind some of that back. But then some of it is also the way in which you know, the systems have developed and where the lowest cost producer wins the contract. No, that's not necessarily the best way of looking at it. But if we're just looking at it in a purely how much grub and how much food do we need and how much are we producing, 
you can see how the United Kingdom, we've been producing, in our food supply, we have about three, four, three and a half thousand, just under calories per day. And that's what is available. The United States, as you'd expect, are eating a little bit more than anybody who's been to the States. You know, they have very large portions. But China, look at the way that China has increased its, its availability for food. Amazing how they've gone from way down here in the 1960s to up to there. Stunning a performance. Lifting all those people out of poverty and, and um, you know, threat of starvation. And Ethiopia are doing the same. And then if you look at what the NHS says we need, this is for us, so the chaps in the audience, we can eat a little bit more, but you no, know, 2,000 is what the NHS recommend the average lady eats, define that, and 2,500 for the average man. So we've got lots of food in the country, it's just what we do with it. And sadly, sadly, we dare to throw a fair amount of it away, food waste, you know. Something that is an absolute anathema to my mother and my father, both of them who lived through the war. Mother was a war refugee, so she understands what the difficulty of not having food means to you. And they just do not throw food away. Well, dad's dead now, but you know, he never did it. And so it's that sort of thing. You know, what is it that we've got in our society that almost normalizes that wastage of food? It's gotta come from somewhere. And you can kind of see the way that the more industrial societies and the industrial elements of the world, that becomes much more pre prevalent. But then in other countries, it's the food wastage in the system. So it never gets to the market. So 25% of all potatoes apparently grown in Latin America never make it to market because they rot away. So we've got to do better. We've got to do better in, the, in our food wastage things. And again, it's something that has just been brought in. By 2025, we're all going to be putting food bins in, in our little waste bins, in our little caddies, and every local authority is going to have to collect those and turn them into bioenergy. No longer will you be able to throw it away in the bin or the waste bin. Now, in some ways, it's great, but on the other hand, you, you think about human behaviour. Oh, it's going into recycling. It's all right. It's being used. So again, we need to be careful that we're not sort of just chucking good food away because we think it's recycled. But, but we can farm less without imperiling our self-sufficiency. Again, this is the, the very large book that um, Dimbleby wrote, the, the restauranter. And he basically says that if we concentrate our efforts on the good bits, we can still grow the vast majority of what we, we eat. And yes, we might have to have a slight reduction in the amount of red meat we're eating, but that's not going to be a bad thing from a greenhouse gas point of view. So we could, if we wanted to, be a more self-sufficient nation, but then we're down to consumer choice, what do you want, how do you do it? Certainly something that governments have shied away from for obvious reasons. You know, it's bad enough when we had those discussions about putting food labels on, but not just food labels, amount of salt, and protein about the eco label. An eco label sounds great. You know, it works for fridges. You know, when you go down it up to Curry's and you see an A, B, or D fridge, well, you know, oh, I'm having an A. It's better, better for, um, energy. And not, you know, of course, with the price of energy being. So we were looking at doing that with food, but it just didn't seem to, 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 to run. There were so many problems. What system? So we, we still have work to do at head office on how can we communicate to people what it is their food is doing, what is the ecological footprint of their food. And that's, that's something to be worked on. But other nations are looking at it as well. Belgium had 16 different indicators that they were using. That's a lot. You know, it's bad enough trying to work out which is the cheapest or which is, you know, you want without doing all of that. But this is, this is sort of, you know, the thing is that we can free up a third of the land, a third of the land we can free up if we sort of make some choices. Now, first of all, we improve productivity. And that sounds, ooh, 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 we don't know about that. But 30% of farmers produce 60% of the food in the country. So less, so that's impressive that they, they, they've got it all together. So 70% of farmers only produce 40%. Now, what are they doing? Can, can they be made better? Or are they happy in their sort of, sort of, their ways? 
I don't know that they will be able to be happy if we're going to get these changes in agricultural support. Can they survive as businesses? Can they survive that? Or will they, or do they do a bit of farming because they've got a campsite and they've got a this and they've got a that? So it's a secondary to their, their thing. So maybe they should say, right, we'll let that land out to more efficient farmers. So that's the farming better bit. Now reduce your food waste. Now that would make an impact. And then this is the one which is always controversial, where they say 30% reduction in meat. But that's only twice a week that you don't eat meat. You know, or you could do it that you can reduce portion sizes. So you know, that's what we do now, is that we have smaller amounts of meat. You know, when you, you do your mince, you do your spike, well, you're chucking it in a kidney beans or something like that, and you use a smaller amount of meat. So it's all doable. And, and, you know, you know, and I do quite like a lentil, and I love a chickpea, because when I first started working in this area, neck of the woods, I worked at Reading University on a research project looking at diseases and, and chickpeas. And here we are, 40 years later, eating them. Great. So just quickly to finish off, you know, the future. The future of farming. You know, it's all his fault, because he told me to, what to talk about. <laughs> but resource use efficiency. If we're going to do it, do it better. Make sure that the things that you apply are used properly. And that's the big, that's the thing about improving efficiencies. And so, you know, are we as efficient as we can be? I don't think we are, but that's something to look at. And on the back of that, this is, this is the scary one. This is where we're back to nitrates and gases heading off up into the atmosphere and all that sort of stuff. It's that you can see that, okay, we're not, we're not the worst there is, but we're leaking from the system 60 kilograms of nitrate each year. Now, in Holland, it's even worse, but they do have huge problems. I don't know if you've seen it in the press, but they've got such an amount of nutrients in their country because they're buying in all this soya, they're buying in all this stuff, creating these very intensive farming systems. They just cannot get rid of slurry. We were apparently, and, and, and we got this from one of the ministers, so it's got to be true, um, that we're importing Dutch sewage sludge into the UK because they've got nowhere to put it and it comes across in boats. Now, it's actually a very useful resource. It's full of phosphates and lots of organic matter. It's not the end of the world, but the fact that they were having to send their sewage sludge, biosolids, call them what you made, to the UK suggests that they're, over, uh, they're, they're doing something. They've pushed their natural system so much. And the government over there is getting really worried. And so they came up with a, a cunning plan, was that they would reduce the amount of stock in the country by a third. That was going to cost them 25 billion euros. Ooh, that's going to be something. But that is as a consequence of all this vast amount of fertility in the system. So, you know, we're not bad there. So we're looking at how can we, do, how can we use our nitrate better? And this is where technology comes in. And... You, know, you, you can use satellite imagery, so you can look at the colour of your soil, and that correlates very well with the, the um, leaf area index. And so you've got these systems out there which can help guide farmers to put the fertiliser on where they need it. And so this is precision farming. This was all based on GPS technology, which the American military spent millions of billions of dollars developing. And now we are using it on a daily basis in agriculture. And you can see that they, they sort of assess the fields, various, these various images, and then you get a spreading map over here as to how much put on, depending on what the, the plant requires. Whereas before, the standard thing would be putting on 200 weight to the acre, convert into metric if you can, but you just do flat rates across the lot. So there's no precision, there's no... So some bits of the field will get more than it needs, some will get less than it needs. So this is building up that um, extra sort of technological thing. Then we're getting drones and robots, you know. Again, love, you know, farmers do like a nice bit of fancy kit, but some of these picking robots at the moment, okay, not that one, but we do sort of cost at the moment about £2 million, one of them was. And I'm thinking we're, we're a bit away from that. But as discussed, if we're struggling to get labour, we're struggling to get people in to pick these fruits, then perhaps this sort of technology could be something... And then there's a whole host of people out there with drones helping you image things. They were talking about putting pesticides on with a drone. I'm not very keen on that idea, I have to say. 
You know, it will run out of battery, it will go off somewhere, it will crash, it's not the, it's not the best thing. And it's not really on any, on any of the, um, the radars at, at head office that we should have let that one through yet. So that's not going to happen. But drones are there, they're going to be out there. Now, farmers have suddenly discovered that there's a thing which the crops are growing in, it's called soil. But it's not just a chemically inert media which where you stick your, your, your seed in, you chuck your fertiliser on. It's something to be looked after. So here we've got a rather miserable looking soil, caked. It's low in organic matter. You can see it's not looking happy. Whereas this one here, that's the sort of soil you want. So this last few years, we've had a real switching on, a whole sort of flowering of interest in soil. And it's all been wrapped up in the regenerative ag, regen ag, as, as many people are calling it. Now, you know, if anybody's listened to the archers, I'm fairly sure they're talking about regen agriculture and the archers. And it's a sort of, uh, you know, some, some of the old boy farmers say, oh, you're just reinventing mixed farming, how it used to be in the older days, crop rotations, you know, keeping animals in there, putting in back organic matters. But they're also using some fancy kits. Now, a lot of regen agriculture relies on this sort of continuous green cover which has got living roots and that's the important thing, living roots, because that's where your mycorrhizal fungi, we'll talk a bit about that. And then here we have Charles Darwin, he spent the last part of his, his career and his life looking after worms and studying worms and this is what he had to say, you know, worms have played a more important part in the history of the world than most persons would at first suppose. Groundbreaking stuff, maybe at the time, but you know, they are there. Now, one of the things about precision far about region agriculture is that ploughing's bad. You know? But it is it, is it? You know, a lot of organic farmers still have to plough because they can't use glyphosate. And so when these things are being looked at about how, how do we write systems and how do we pay people and how do we encourage them, you can't ban ploughing. But on the other hand, ploughing does reduce organic matter. And it's not very good for soil biology, just for the very fact you're slicing it up and turning it all over. So the whole point of regen agriculture is to get your soil alive, get it more, more functioning as a, as a living material than just an inert growing medium. But there's a place for the plough, so let's not forget about it. And then you've kind of got this bit of an in-between one here, which is a min till, which is discs. And the other one is, is the, the, the amount of horsepower needed for this is considerably less than that. So that would be a 300 horsepower tractor on an 8401. This would be 200 horsepower, significantly less fuel. So from a farmer's point of view, saving money. From an ecological point of view, less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, less kit, and it's cheaper. So the whole point is that it does, I mean, it is a kind of virtuous circle. The only problem is that this bit of kit here, this fancy sort of, is that an avatar drill or one of the, the drains is about £120,000. Not every farmer can afford one of those, so we are putting money towards bits of it, but it is quite expensive. But it has this whole soil thing has sort of kicked off this whole interest and re renewed interest and vigour on soil and microbes, etc. etc. So we've got down at the bottom, these are the mycorrhizal fungi. These are just the little fungi that live in the soil which latch into and connect to farm to roots. And so they're increasing the, the surface area and drawing in fung and drawing in, in um, nutrients. At the top now these, sir, anybody who grows peas and beans will know what we're talking about here. These are root nodules, bacteria live in these little nodules, pulling in nitrogen from the atmosphere at no great cost, no effort. They're doing it with fancy little enzymes, something that we have to heat up to, was it 200 degrees pressure, atmospheres of pressure to make with our stuff. But you can see how all this happened, all the microbiome, so guts in, in animals, we've got replacing in organic fertilizers, improving soil carbon sequestration, biofuels. It's, it's, it's a really interesting and happening part of, of, of agriculture. So the future, I think, has got quite a lot going for it. And just an example, oh yeah, there's always a quote, but this here is what's called a living mulch. So this is strips of white clover, and that pulls in nitrogen, and then the crop is put into here, into these slots. So precision agriculture, GPS, can be down to two millimetres with the right signal. Really accurate, really good. So you can pull into there. No need to put any fertiliser on. What's not to like about that? 
And, and so that's, that's the development, and quite a lot of the progressives are doing it. Right then, just the final section, there's not much more. You'll be pleased to know. Um, we're looking here at um, what we're looking at. Uh, choice. All this choice. And you know, soya milk everywhere. Is it a good thing? Well, I'm not convinced. I don't like it. So I'm quite happy to drink mouldy milk and take the hit. Um, over here, we've got, we've got the sort of the changes that's happening. Have we reached peak cows? You know, cows are going down in numbers since the 1990s or whenever it was, the number of cattle reducing. Now, part of that is because they're improving in efficiency, and part of it is that they're changing diets. And you ask young people, are they that keen on eating meat, or do they want more of this sort of stuff over here, which is vegetarian, flexitarian, you name it. And the young uns are quite, you know, are up for it. So we're getting changing consumer habits, which will reflect on the supermarket shelves. Complicated one, this is for the meat eaters who like a bit of meat. You know, you always hear that these, these sort of headline figures that meat's really bad, but if you can grow it in a more benign way, you can grow it in a way which is um, quite as demanding on, on resources. You can see that all the Europeans, you know, we're better at growing than global, we're better at our pork than global, and the chickens. So with a little bit of extra animal welfare, some thoughts, some diets, some breeding, you know, don't give up on meat, because, you know, it's, it's a good thing. You know, and, and the grazing animals have very many benefits in the wider landscape. You know, things such as you know, chalk grassland, if it wasn't for the sheep grazing it, we wouldn't have it. So we do need stock in the, in the, outer, in, in the, in the environment. But, you know, you can see that this is kind of you know, where a lot of efforts being put into this sort of plant-based burgers. I think I'd rather eat lentils and just have them on their own rather than wrapped up as a burger. And then you're onto this one, the cultured meat using fancy technology and ooh, all manner of things. I'm not convinced I wouldn't be doing that. But then the alternative is insects. Now, who wants an insect? Hmm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but you can see ecologically, they make a heck of a lot of sense. They use vastly less amounts of any resources. You give them two kilograms of food, you get a kilogram of insect back. To get the same, you'd have to give 25 kilograms of food to a cow to get the same amount of back. So they do have a place, but you know, we, we have to really push it. But you know, this is, this is something that the Swiss were doing. They were grinding up their insects to make them into these sort of little balls rather than serving them as like the Chinese were doing here. And then this is you culturing them on food waste. And apparently Tesco was going to start using food waste, which is coming into them, to grow insects on to make feed. Hmm. So other things we can do, future, changing climate. Hey, what's not to like about some vineyards? Nice little bit of vineyards there. We're doing really well with them in the UK on the South Downs, the Chalklands, very good. We're you can see the numbers are increasing, 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 increasing. So that's the area grown. It's not a vast area. Now, let's not kid ourselves. But it is an increasing area. And from the point of view of foreign investment, French people and the Chinese, I don't know, and even Brazilians are buying, are buying stuff in the UK. We don't make many bottles, only 8.7 million bottles of UK wine. But that is quite a, you know, it's a start. And I suspect we'll see more of it. Then other things which are coming in the future, vertical farming. Woohoo! Now this is old school vertical farming, you're just sort of stacking them up and picking them. Strawberries all cultured under grass, green, greenhouses, so it's a much more controlled environment. Controlled environment, horticulture, very expensive to do. And then you've got this stuff here, which uh, is growing everything under LED bulbs. And there are places in Scotland now using it to, to grow trees for tree nurseries. So it's starting to come through. We're beginning to see a little bit of that coming through. All right, then, carbon farming. Yeah, you know, using the natural environment to pull down carbon. Now, this was a field of wheat, and then it went into grassland. So even that, that change from intensive agriculture into a natural meadow, vastly less fertiliser, so we're drawing down carbon in that respect. But these were just the poppies that came up in the first flush of a year, so that's okay. 
Trees, we've got to grow more trees. We've got a huge target for trees. We have to grow 7,500 a year. We're nowhere near it, but um, they're a good thing. So you'll see lots of these little field corners being put up here. Great from a, a small farm point of view, but not really adding the vast acres of trees we want. But then we've got to have what kind of tree? Are we growing conifers? which will draw down huge amounts of carbon very quickly, or do we do the slow burner, which is a nice little bit of oak, a nice little bit of beech, potentially. We would have said ash, but that's all gone down with disease, so we can't be doing any of that. But you can see that trees are actually pulling down, and forestry is pulling down carbon where agriculture is creating it. And since we import 80% of our trees in the UK, you know, talk about wood, insufficiency or ins you know, that's what we need lots of trees but when you do plant a tree you've got to remember that it does its sequestration early and then it stores it for later and if you can use that tree for something such as a building product that's great but over time when it decays that will release the carbon back into the atmosphere but it's that early phase there where you get the most off your carbon sequestration and then you're looking here at just where we are as a nation and this is where region agriculture comes in is by far and away the biggest carbon store we have in the country is in our soils and we've got peat as well so why should we be putting peat on gardens i don't know but we're going to stop that that's all coming to an end the um the, the regulations have been passed through that but peat over here is the biggest carbon store we have in any soil and the nice thing about it is it goes on it doesn't stop it just carries on so it, as it gets wetter and wetter then we've got some weird and wonderfuls coming up i don't know that these will be going to become mainstream agriculture agroforestry there's a bit of a, a target for agroforestry but i don't think it's going to happen this is i think in spain or is it italy and you can see the whole idea is to grow these trees which pull down the carbon and they keep the crop cool uh, I can't see it happening really in the UK but um, it will make the countryside look different but the one we could see more of is this thing with, with animals, Silvano pasture and these are actually cricket bat willows growing on a damp little bit of field near Reading somewhere and you can see the new ones planted here this is the new cricket bat willows which is put in so that's all rather nice there and then you're drawing down the carbon it all gets used and ultimately you're producing timber and and meat and animal grazing on the same bit of ground other things we've got coming up are things such as biofuels where we grow the crop to make ethanol and then we put that in our cars and call it E10 not convinced but um, you know, there's a huge amount, this is, similar, this is all the American acreage here, there's a huge amount of their crop goes into making bioethanol for cars, some of which they export to, to, to China. Again, you're thinking, well, is that really what we should be doing with it? But that's the way it is. And you can see that the Americans really have taken it on board, biggest producers of bioethanol by a long, long way. This lot of the Brazilians, they use their sugarcane for that. And then in Europe, we have a small amount. We've got a couple of plants in the UK, frequently mothball because it makes more money not to do anything than it is to switching them on. But we do have a couple of plants of bioethanol plants on the East Coast, and we import some grain from who's selling it cheaper. Then we're on to things such as anaerobic digestion. You grow maize, so we grow 100,000 hectares of maize in the country which could be doing other things, and that puts it into these big tanks, ultimately produces carbon dioxide and methane, which is separated, and they get paid vast amounts of money. It has a hugely distorting effect on local farmers, so if you're doing this with your renewable heat incentives, you get essentially a £1,000 an acre for growing it kind of stuff, huge amounts of money, way more than the rent is, and so small local farmers get squeezed out. Other bio crops here are short rotation coppice, so you grow willow and every three years you chop it down, make it into wood chip, chuck it off into drax, and then you've got miscanthus. Again, these things are a sort of possible uses for agricultural land, but they'll never really become mainstream because you know, the, the sort of footprints when you do the analysis of these things is quite 
quite large you know, to produce the same amount of energy you know, with these things requires a huge amount of land and say a nuclear power station is seven hectares and it's 58,000 hectares so you can kind of see that there are okay nuclear is not without its issues but this thing is sort of really hard and then the final one in this lot is solar you know it's a bit emotive and it's certainly not got courage favors with with head office and and the secretary of state is you know, she's not that keen on it thinking it takes land good agricultural land out of production but as you can see this is a german system and solar power is uh, these panels are so cheap now that instead of them having them at, a, at an angle you can put them vertically and they still do quite well or you put them on stilts and you get the sheep to graze under them or you put them on even higher stilts and you can crop underneath them and with the temperature difference underneath it in hot countries it grows better underneath those sorts of panels than it does on uh, in the open but these are things that you know society has to answer do we want solar panels do we want that energy we need the energy it is absolutely imperative you know we, we've seen the the um crisis that the, the russian gas has created in western europe so how do we overcome that and solar is by, by far and away one of the cheapest forms of new energy but it does have some consequences and that's you know farmers love this it's a great income stream absolutely and so they are you know, where where you've got grid connections and you can connect it up to the grid it is a really good opportunity for farmers but is it agriculture is it farming and on that, I shall finish. Right then, that's it. That's just a picture of a robot. Yeah, just, you know, I quite like the look of it. So that was it, and there we are. That's the end of it. Okay, done. Woo. Some of the, the future is in our hands. I think, you know, this is where we come in. It's, it's, it's all well and good saying that they must do something about it. Policy should sit everything up. But, you know, we as individuals have got a role to play in this. And if it's just sort of changing your diet a little bit, those sorts of things, you know. And that's why, you know, no, no one should be telling you how to do things. You know, I think, you know, you've got to do, work it out. But if you're given the information and you let, you know, people tell you, well, this is a better than that and there's, there's this advantage, that, that sort of stuff then we can make the difference as ourselves as individuals. And I think that's where, you know, there's 66 billion million offers in the country. So let's give it a go. All right, sorry, you had a question. <laughs> well, certain, com certain geographies do have, have, have goats as their primary source of protein. But it's an interesting question. We went with sheep, though, didn't we? You know, sheep and goats early on were quite closely related. And... We probably went with cattle because they're more placid. They don't escape like goats do. And anybody who's ever kept goats and seen them, they have this, this amazing escapologist actions. And then they climb all over the place. So I think maybe we just kept goats because it was easier. But yeah, it's, a good, it's an interesting question. And there's a lot of goats. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So mm, how, do, how do we... But then you know, societies get into patterns, don't they? Yeah, so how do, how, do we, how do we break out of it? I know we've got the lactose thing, and certainly you know, certain people with lactose intolerance can, can be drinking goat's milk. And for small-scale farmers, and you're thinking not just in the UK or, or in other places, you know, places like Tanzania, for instance, or, or those sort of geographies, where they are struggling to create decent um, dairy cattle, maybe those are the sort of countries where this approach would, would have some benefits. Yeah. And then this brings into question you know, the, the whole concept of, of how is it that you know, we have six big major food retailers. You know? But they are, they are looking at it. Now, is it. Have we got time for this? Or you know, do we need to, to make the government? And this is kind of coming back to the Extinction Rebellion and the school strike sort of element, is how far can we push or can the policymakers and can, can government push the agenda? Have they got the... Um, the appetite for it and you know you whatever mr johnson did as an individual he was far and away the most forward thinking of our prime ministers when it came to environmental matters he was certainly more in that space than the current lot are so you know, we need to to encourage your politicians and how do we do that with conversations do we get do we write them letters i don't know but yes i, I take your point and and 
you know, we don't want to just sort of bimble along and it all goes horribly wrong and then we sink slowly into the mire when we could have taken a different route. Well, that's true, and, and you know, there's, there's many reasons why. There's, there's, there's not a huge amount of elms out there at the moment, so we have, you know, those, those components haven't been offered. The payment rates for what was on offer were the very lowest components, but we're told that the newer stuff will be coming through. But yes, it, it's, that, it's that balance, and if we can land some of these ideas about you know, looking after soils and making it more more productive to be more or to, to farm your soil in a slightly different way think about the the regen agriculture versus the much harder cultivation systems we've used in the past now that's where some of that system change could happen and we could bring in a huge amount of soil carbon through just small alterations in the way that farmers are, are cultivating the fields and if the payments and the encouragement is there and it doesn't need to necessarily just come from government you know there's a vast amount of money out there with the private offsetting companies discuss but there's a lot of money potentially coming in because we haven't got enough money in the kitty in government we just do not have that money anymore and we've, we've seen you know there are other areas which are wanting that and needing it but private finance i think could really make a big difference. However, it's whole new, it needs to be sort of regulated, it needs to be brought in, but it is going to be different. And I think if we were to have this conversation in 10 years' time, then I think we will be seeing a different way in which these things are sitting. 